So first, on my very right, we have Julie Smith. Some of you may know her already since she's the chair of the Early Childhood Education Department here at City College. I found out she's actually a graduate of City College, right? She's got your AA here. She went to Westmont here in Santa Barbara, got her degree in sociology, and got her master's degree at Cal State Northridge in child development and family relations. And then you did some further graduate work and have some experience and expertise in the field of autism, of which I want to say on the job connection today, I just approved a job for a family that has uh, twins that are both autistic and they're looking for some help with their kids. So. And then to my right here, we have Ann Peake with the Santa Barbara um, Unified School District. She is an analyst, certified personnel analyst. Is that your formal name now? Or is that uh, no, different? my actual title is coordinator for certificated personnel. Okay. <laughs> so anything related to teachers, that's me. Anything related to teachers on the hiring aspect. So she's a very good person to know. If you want to network, today's an excellent day for networking um, and talking to people who are the gateway to the decision makers or are the decision makers themselves. So beautiful that you're here. She is a UCSB grad, right? Yep. And, <laughs> and the Santa Barbara Unified School District has 22 traditional continuation charter and alternative schools on 21 campuses. So it's pretty big. And been around since the 1800s, little factoid yes. there. <laughs> and to her right, we have our friend Russell Granger, who is actually here at Santa Barbara City College, but most recently at San Marcos High School. Um, and so he'll be able to talk expertly on what it's like to work in secondary education. He's teaching the automotive here, and that's what you did at San Marcos as well, which is the career and technical field, right? Right. So, and UC, uh, UCSB, yes. Brad? Another and program, And what did you get your BA in? Sociology and Anthropology. Oh, okay, Two. you guys are friends then. Yeah. <laughs> and your master's degree at Fullerton. Yeah. And what did you get in your master's degree in? Uh, educational technology. Oh, cool. All right. Any questions you have about technology and education? He's your guy, right? <laughs> CTE is a hot topic yeah, on education. Yeah, absolutely. So. You're right. The technology is so important to know today. Okay. And what a skill that can uh, be on your resume. That would well, the CTE, great. the career technical C oh, education. Career and technical. Yeah. Oh, and technology. That. And technology, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and to the very right is Ann Hubbard. She's the superintendent of Hope School District, which is here, Hope Elementary School District, which is here in Santa Barbara. And there are three schools, I believe, right, in the district. About a thousand students? Yep, right around. Yeah. And she also is a UCSB grad, got her teaching credential from there. She went to Cal Poly, got her master's in educational leadership, and has an administrative credential as well. And then ended up getting her PhD. No, no, no. Sorry. I'm working on my dissertation on right dissertation. now for Sorry. my EDD. <laughs> Concordia University. Uh -huh. <laughs> I saw that on LinkedIn. In progress. <laughs> but besides being in the administrative, she basically has worked her way up over the years. So I'm interested to hear your story about how all of that has transpired over time. I mean, you think you might, you know, you're going to have one career, but actually, you're probably going to have multiple careers or jobs, you know, as you're going through um, your your life journey, and. Uh, she, let's see, you taught 20 years mostly in fifth grade. No, middle school. Middle school. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's mostly okay. fifth grade somewhere. <laughs> and you served as an assistant principal and a principal. So mm -hmm. you've kind of seen mm -hmm. kind of the, the whole spectrum. So thank you so much for coming. We would love to have you talk about your career journey, like kind of where you started out and how you ended up where you are. And I'll have each one of you go through and share a little bit about that and then um, maybe you know, three to five minutes, and then we'll go on from there. So, Julie, would you like to start? Okay. Um, well, as you said, I graduated from Santa Barbara City College, and at that point had no idea what I wanted to do. I just took general education classes, transferred to Westmont, was sociology major, and I happened to take a class that you had to do a practicum in, and I was new in the area, and so one of my husband's friend's wives taught at a preschool and she invited me to do my practicum with her at the preschool. And that was my first introduction to working with early childhood education. Um, in my own personal life, I had never gone to preschool, so that wasn't even part of my experience. Um, ended up starting to work at the preschool and eventually um, 
give 15 years, I went back and got a master's degree that included early childhood education and family um, studies from Northridge. And then 15 years later, went back and got another master's that had to do with, um, well, it was a, a, what do I want to say? It was an earth expedition um, master's that had you go to different countries in the world every summer for three years. But your focus was the natural sciences. And then I took that <laughs> curriculum and put it into the preschool curriculum. How do you do science for preschoolers? And then the last um, degree or certificate actually had to do with autism and research. Um, I adopted four kids in this process, have seven. Um, but adopted four, and they all ended up somewhere on the autism spectrum. So for my own personal information as well as for what we were seeing in the, the profession as more and more children coming in with special needs and come in with on autism spectrum, I thought I'd better know what was going on. So again, as you said, my, my career has transitioned. I started at City College 25 years ago as a laboratory teaching assistant working in the lab with student teachers, ran a couple of grants, and then eventually worked into a full-time academic <coughs> position where I've been for over 20 years. So that's kind of my career path. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. So um, once I graduated from UCSB, I got a degree in English and just figured I would write. You know, I was, <laughs> just had these dreams <laughs> that I'd write the great American novel. Um, once I graduated, I moved back to Washington, D.C. and worked back there for a while, which was great because I got to use my writing skills. Came back to Santa Barbara, needed a job because you have to pay the bills. <laughs> and I landed a job at ABC Clio doing editorial work. I worked there for a few years, um, got kind of bored to be honest with it. It wasn't quite my dream of what writing should look like. I applied for a job um, with Caro's Restaurants. They had a job in their human resources office. And I got that job, and that was great because I did get to write things that were sent out to all of the restaurants. At the time, Caro's had 108 restaurants in the seven western states. So it was great for me because what I was writing were mostly tips about waiting tables and safety tips, things like how you want to hold your tray so that you don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. Not real exciting stuff, <laughs> but at least I was getting to use my writing skills. Um, Caro's at one point decided, well, they got sold, and so the headquarters was moving out of Santa Barbara. Well, I wasn't going to move out of Santa Barbara. That was just not on my game plan. And so the school district had an opening in their human resources office. I um, applied for that position. And the funny part was that the director at the time in human resources told the committee, she will never take this job. Why would we hire her? And I have to admit, it was probably one of the worst interviews I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life. Everything that actually could possibly go wrong in that interview went wrong. I had long hair at the time. And um, I had it in a clip, and the clip fell out during the interview, and I was so <laughs> nervous, I picked the clip up, and I was literally playing with it under the table, because I was just so <laughs> nervous, and I was trying to keep from using my, my hands. But um, one of the people on the committee commented, you know what, I think she would do okay in this job. She seems to like kids, you know, because I had volunteered as a Young Life Leader for years out at Dos Pueblos. Um, after that, I joined up with Teen Court, and the funny part is that they did hire me after all. I am still there. The director <laughs> is long gone. Although he is retired now, and he likes to come in and say, you know, I was responsible for hiring her. Um, I'm like, that's funny, because at the time he didn't really want to hire me, because he thought I'd quit. But I've done almost every job in the department, and I love it. I love what I do. I think education is the best career you can possibly go into. It does have its challenges, but it's all worth it in the end. Thank you. Russell. All right. Um, I left high school not ready for college, um, and I wasn't very successful with just a high school diploma in supporting myself. Uh, so within a year, I went back to the community college. 
uh, into one of their um, uh, certificate programs, automotive technology. Uh, the day I got that certificate, uh, along with my uh, smog license, I went out and applied for three jobs. I was offered all three. Uh, and the job I went home with paid three times what the three jobs I was working at currently <laughs> paid combined. Wow. So the difference between having an education and a skill and not was immediately apparent. So I, I worked as a tech uh, for a long time, uh, plus I continued to go to school. I, it's what I, I enjoyed. So eventually I got an associate degree in automotive technology, a uh, bachelor's degree in sociology and uh, anthropology. Um, all while working full time as a tech. And then after about 20 years, my partner and I in the same location, uh, we lost our lease. Um, so this thing I'd been doing for 20 years, literally we had about two weeks notice. Um, we had a lot of notice, but we'd gotten that every five years for the previous 20, uh, and we just started ignoring it. Anyway, this time they really got it. I was really out. So uh, uh, June 30th, I was out. Um, I was going to take a year off, and I'd save some money, um, and I was really looking forward to that. Yeah, Fourth of July weekend, I got an email. Dude, there's a job opening for a, you know, a, a teaching position in automotive technology at San Marcos High School. I was in Central America. I was looking forward to a lot of time down there. <laughs> anyway, I left all my friends, came back early, applied for the job, and to this day I'm not quite sure, but they hired me. <laughs> Absolutely no experience teaching. I knew my field well, automotive technology, but teaching is a very, very different animal. Um, I begin to wonder if there's really any crossover at all. Um, but it turned out after a really rough first year, I loved it. Um, loved it so much. I worked hard to stay in it, um, continued to go to school, earn my master's in educational technology to help in the classroom. Uh, and I've been doing that. This is now my 10th year of teaching. So it's, it's turned out to be a, a wonderful second phase of my career journey. Beautiful. Thanks. Anne. So I had a different pathway. I was one of those people, and I'm sure each of you have that, can probably raise your hand and name the person that had the teacher that made me go, wow, I want to do that. That person has had such an impact on my life. And that was my sixth grade teacher. And from that sixth grade moment on, um, it was like, well, I knew I was going into education. And believe me, it wasn't like um, anything earth shattering. It was just a teacher that really connected well with his class and really respected us as people, not just a, a, you know, a set of students. He invited us to his wedding, you know, and we all <laughs> came up with the themes and you know, that, kind of, that kind of, you know, that kind of teacher that allowed us to, you know, to develop. And that was my model for teaching. I knew I wanted to do it when I, when I went all through high school, you know, babysitting, all, always looking for jobs around kids. And then and at UCSB, you could be any degree you wanted. I knew I wanted to go to the Graduate School of Education, but it was really wide open. There was no degree of education, so I studied communications. I like to talk a lot. And so I studied <laughs> communications, and I knew that my, my intent was to go to the Graduate School of Education, um, which I did. In, in UCSB, during my time there, I did volunteer. It was great. I was a, a big sister for the... Um, the Big Brother, Big Sister program that was very, very fulfilling. Had a fabulous um, little sister that I, it was, it was just a great opportunity. She actually spent the night with me in, at our apartment in UCSB several times. You know, we would do <laughs> fun little things. I don't know, her mom must have been crazy to let her spend the night in UCSB. <laughs> and I live into it. But, but, you know, we had a really great, strong relationship. And um, just loved that. I was a nanny, a live-in nanny after, you know, uh, after starting my senior year for, for family. I had five little girls, fifth grade and under, and me, again, <laughs> crazy parents. Um, <laughs> but really enjoyed my time with kids and knew that's what I wanted to do. So I went into the teacher credential program uh, after I graduated and started teaching. And um, after about, I think it was around my 12th year of teaching, I was in a K-8 school and I was in the sixth grade teaching mathematics. and the administration at the time decided they were going to separate two campuses and asked if I was interested in being the administrator for the junior high. I said, no way. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to be an administrator. I'm never, ever leaving the kids. Mm -hmm. I will never do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't for, for a few years. And then it was about five or six years later, I thought, you know, 
I don't know, maybe that's time. I, I thought I wanted to, to go into teaching teachers so I could have an, a larger effect on teachers and the kind of teachers I think should be out there in the world. And I went back to Cal Poly to get my master's degree. And at the time they said, well, if you get an administrative credential, it's only a couple extra classes and some field work, you should do it. I said, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to be an administrator. And, they, and their argument was, the director's argument of the program was, look, it will make you a better teacher of teachers if you at least get this credential. So I said, okay, and did some field work. I started off at an elementary school because that was a natural fit for me and um, loved it so much. I took on a second internship at a middle school and thought, might as well round it out and took on a third internship at a high school. So I was doing three internships at once and um, just really, really enjoyed that. Saw that I could actually, instead of just having my classes, whether it was when I was teaching a single fifth grade class or whether when I was teaching at the middle school and I would have five classes, I really loved connecting with my kids and saw that as an administrator I could still connect with my kids even on a larger scale. Now they weren't just my class were my kids, they were all my kids. I'm kind of greedy like that. <laughs> so uh, so I, I thought, yeah, I really do, I love this. And um, when I graduated from there I became an assistant principal outside of Cal Poly in Paso Robles and then uh, up, back up in the Bay Area in Cupertino. And when my husband retired from the fire department, he was a battalion chief for San Jose Fire, um, we said, we can go anywhere. And at that point, there was an ad in the, or it wasn't even an ad, it was an article in the paper. And at the very bottom of the article, it said, and Dr. Cash will also be looking for a principal at Washington Elementary School in Santa Barbara. Well, I had gone, I had lived in Santa Barbara when I was a nanny and when I was at UCSB, and so I said to my husband, you want to move to Santa Barbara? <laughs> and he said, yeah, let's look into it. So I applied, just on a whim, and um, lo and behold, got the job, and moved my family down here, and my son started kindergarten at Washington, and my uh, daughter was in middle school, and, um, and then after um, a couple years, uh, one of my former Cal Poly professors said that he was leaving his superintendent role up in a little district in San Luis Obispo and would, you know, I should consider it. And so I thought, no, I don't want to be a superintendent, no. <laughs> but he encouraged me and said, just, you know, you might as well at least just look into it. And it was a one school district. I thought, oh, okay, I, maybe I can learn a little bit more and progress in my career and tried it and loved it. The problem is, is that when I moved up there, the plan was that my family was eventually going to move up there with me. We had my niece living with us at the time, who was a senior at Santa Barbara High School, and we thought, that's not fair to make her move her senior year of high school. So the plan was they'd finish out, and then my, my daughter, who was going to be a junior, and my son, who was going to be in third grade, would move up there uh, with me. But they had a family intervention at spring break and said, we're never leaving Santa Barbara. <laughs> so either you find a job down here or we're going to do this, this uh, you know, dual living situation for a while. So uh, this position opened up at Hope Elementary School District and I applied and lo and behold, uh, they hired me as superintendent there. So it's, it, having spent 20 years in a classroom and then done assistant principal and principalship, a superintendent slash principalship, um, I really do feel like it, it, having that, that varied background has been a huge help for me in understanding what my teachers are going through, what the parents feel like, what my principals are dealing with. Um, so it, it, it was a, a funny little pathway, but I always knew I wanted to be in education and it is so, so rewarding. Thank you. So I'm going to have you talk a little bit longer about um, your experience as an elementary school teacher and then compare that a little bit about what you do during the day um, in your current job. Well, I can guarantee you this, that in education, you will wake up thinking, my day is going to look like this, <laughs> and it never, ever does. <laughs> you have no idea what your day will bring, and that's even in the classroom. You'll come up with the most fabulous lesson plan and know exactly what you are going to do, and that's the day, you know, that uh, little Terry throws up everywhere and you know the kids then all you know have that multiple effect and you just it's all out the window. Um, it, it, it really is an incredibly rewarding job. Um, you and I, I've taught in the elementary level, I, I taught fifth grade for, for five years and then in the middle school level 
Um, and I love them both, really. Um, the, the amount of uh, connection you can get and, and human reward back and forth is amazing. It's also tough. There were years I taught in an inner city school in San Jose, and I would come home every day just crying, and my husband would say, what's wrong? And I would just regale him with stories of my students' struggles. And he'd say, Ann, you can't save them all. And I'd say, but I have to. I have to. Um, and sure enough, that is, we've, we've also, we foster. And that's where we got our first <laughs> foster daughter, um, who now went to graduate Cal State Monterey, and guess what she's going to become? A teacher. Um, so, you know, that is, it, it just is one of those jobs where you can't go in and expect just to teach. You really are there to be, to, ha to have an impact on, on lives. And you, it might not even be the lives that you, might not even be your most neediest. Um, I certainly wasn't my sixth grade teacher's most neediest student, but he had a huge impact on my life, as did other teachers. Um, but it really is, a, it is a, a career that will bring you constant surprise, um, challenge, but also huge rewards. Um, and it's just something, education is such a critical part of society that it is a job that um, hopefully even on your darkest day, you can say, but I know I did this, you know, I, I made this impact today in, in making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And um, I just can't think of something better I'd rather do with my time. So what does a day look like as a superintendent? Oh, it's, it's nasty. Be probably different. It's, nasty. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's horrific. No. <laughs> um, well, it, um, this particular year, I, I have inherited a difficult, difficult budget situation, and, and ironically enough, as I was being interviewed for this position, when the board interviewed me and asked me about strengths and weaknesses, what I called out as one of my weaknesses was budget. I mean, you, I have experience as a teacher and as a site, over a site budget, but um, I inherited a really wonky budget situation, so I'm learning a lot. Um, so my, my day is a little bit different, but I'm also... Uh, very fortunate to have a very small district with a thousand students and three schools. It's a very reasonable district. It's not like what Carrie has to do in Santa Barbara Unified. I, I know every one of my teachers by name in the district. Before they came, I took all three yearbooks and took this. I'm a little bit of a stalker. I took the pictures <laughs> and I made cards for each employee um, and memorized who they were and what school they were at and what they did. And if, then I did go on to like websites to see if I could find out more information about them. <laughs> and it was just my way that when they came in in August to come back to the campus, that I would know them and have that done with and then I could start on the students. And so um, I really am a hands-on superintendent. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you inspire a student in the inner city who's got a lot of obstacles? Yeah, it, right? it, it is, um, it, it depends. Each student is individual. And so really getting to know, that was my, my um, forte as a teacher, is really truly getting to know my students. And even when I, for instance, when I was in San Jose Unified in an inner city school, I had 150 158 kids, but really making sure I knew each and every kid. And I would do that in different ways because I taught math, and so I had five periods of math. Um, they thought it was silly at first, but I would have like a star of the week for each class. So each student would have some time to tell me about themselves and what they were, you know, what they liked. A lot of times, especially in middle school, it was about their music and things. Shoes, tennis shoes were really big that year, different <laughs> Nikes. Um, but really getting to know them. Also, I would love, rather than being in a teacher's lounge, my room was open up at lunch and, and kids could come in. I also worked, um, volunteered, they couldn't believe it, for a Saturday school program. So these were the kids <laughs> that had to make up truancies. But I would come in with ideas or ways that we could do community service during that time. So they weren't just sitting there oh. and sitting, which is what some other teachers did. We actually did projects. And I would talk with them about how does that feel to give back and to do something meaningful. My own foster daughter, who, you know, I hate to even refer to as a foster daughter because she aged out of the system with us. She's my daughter. But she still teases me about the child labor I made her do, stepping on <laughs> the senior center. But, it, you know, it really is, the, guess what we did during that time? We talked. And we talked about her struggles and what she was going through. 
and what was going on in her life. So it's really about connecting with those kids because I think that each of you, whether you were a struggling student or not, can think about if you know a, an adult that cares about you, how are you, what are you gonna do for your work for them, for that teacher? You're gonna work really super hard, right? You do not wanna let them down. And so that's the, the most important thing is really letting the kids know you, you are there for them and you care about them and they will, they will go above and beyond um, you know, as much as you can. And then also sometimes it did. It, that was just one of many foster kids. There were other kids I brought home. Um, you know, I have a very, very understanding husband. Um, <laughs> but really just letting them know you will go, uh, you know, you, will, you are going to go for bat for them and whatever means you can, you know, in connecting with them. So it's, it's you can't solve all their problems and that was difficult for me to, to learn but really making sure that kids know you care about them in a very meaningful way, not just during that 50 minutes they're there or the, the six hours they're there, but getting to know them and, and reaching out with them. That, I would say, is the number one thing for any type of kids, because there are needy kids in, in some of the wealthier school districts also. Mm -hmm. um, they, have, they have some of the same needs and some different needs, but it's really about making sure kids know you care about them. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. So, Russell, let's talk a little bit about your experience in uh, high school. Um, maybe contrast a little bit to Anne, or maybe some of the similarities as well. Okay, well, you know, the rewards in teaching, yeah, they're emotional, they're gratifying, they, they at least in my experience, were not as monetary <laughs> as industry. Um, <laughs> that being said, I found those ultimately of higher value. I, I've enjoyed teaching much more than I enjoyed being out in industry. Um, the, I, I can't think of anything more uh, rewarding or, or um, soul-filling, um, at least in my life. So that, that part, I think, is, is different. Also, for me, um, as, a, as an electives teacher, um, students have to choose to kind of be there. And when you're teaching a shop class, Predominantly, they will be uh, males you're in auto shop. There's kind of this gender bias, uh, which I worked very hard to get rid of. Uh, I was very proud when I left. I actually had 33% of my students were females, where when I started, I was lucky to get one, but I made wow. sure um, that they felt warm, respected, um, comfortable within that environment, and it, it snowballed. So, uh, for me, it was kind of a different animal uh, in industry, especially as part of a uh, as an employee and as a business owner. The model is completely different than uh, public education. Um, you know, as Donald Trump loves to say, "You're fired." You know, if it's not working out for you, right at the top, you change the situation. You know, you just get rid of that problem. You know, um, at the um, public school level, especially the high school level. Uh, you take all comers, everybody who's in your district. Um, it is mandatory that they have that education, uh, and it's mandatory that uh, you know you find a way to make it work. So that was a huge culture shock for me. So you know, before you know, my method of dealing with something was you know my way or the highway. Um, in as a teacher, it's completely flipped. You know, trust me, if you don't reach out and embrace that student and, and meet them way over on their side of the line, um, it's never going to be your way, all right? Um, you, you need to find out what they want, what they need, how they're best going to be served, uh, and they're great about telling you what that's going to be. Um, and then you provide it, and then you sneak in your curriculum within that, you know? So what you're doing is, you know, it's almost like tricking them into learning. You know, you find out how am I going to get that math or that science uh, curriculum through this vehicle. In my case, it literally was a vehicle um, uh, as a part of your education. And that, to me, was the fun part, the rewarding part. Um, uh, the hard part is you've got a room full of 30-some teenagers um, with all that you know, teenagers bring to the table. And if you're from industry and they're all staring at you, it's, it's hard to engage them for, you know, 90 minutes at a time in learning. Um, and that, that, was a, that was a huge challenge. So 
I would literally go home when I first started teaching, pacing the floor up all night. Uh, my wife, ironically, who's a teacher, asking me, wouldn't you rather be back in the industry? <laughs> I'd really like to get some sleep. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it was tough from the beginning, but the interesting thing was, as a new teacher, I didn't know good from bad. So I would ask other teachers, come in and observe me, tell me what I'm doing wrong, and then I'd ask the students, what do you want? I'm learning here. I can create any curriculum, any set of instruction. I might as well gear it toward what you all want. So every, at the end of every term, uh, we were on the block schedule, so we'd have four. Um, the students at the end would have to give me five ideas, five things that they would change about my instruction or the wow. classroom. And if it was a good idea and it was voted on by the class, they got a $5 gift card to McDonald's. I went out and <laughs> bought those and I was buying ideas. <laughs> All right? And what they had to do is whatever they said needed fixing, they had to give me a way to fix it. They couldn't just you know, wank on me and say, hey, this, 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 and this are really bad. You know, they had to give me the solution to it. And if that solution worked, awesome, for five bucks, I got a, a solution to a problem. And so I did that for about six terms before we kind of plateaued. And that was really awesome. And it was from uh, classroom management to uh, delivery of curriculum. And part of it you know, was an instructional strategy. You don't keep them in a desk for 90 minutes at a time, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Well, I was doing that, and it wasn't working. They asked for the 90 minutes at a time for two weeks and then have three weeks out in the shop. They wanted, they were willing to front load and be uncomfortable for a significant period of time so that they could have this great time afterwards. And it worked, it rocked. But I never would have tried that without their input. So I gave serious, serious, serious credence to what it was they wanted and how I would provide it to them. So I think that was, that was a little bit different. And to touch on what you said, the relationships, you know, um, outside of class, weekends, we, I say hang out, we would do car shows, we would do events, we would do outreach, uh, those sorts of things uh, with the students. And if you're always there, my door was always open. I never left the classroom. I probably didn't know half the staff on, on my <laughs> campus, but I knew almost all the students. Um, then you get to reach all of those. Yes, sir? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, so how do you make students want to do more? And interestingly enough, when I walked in, um, no disrespect to the previous teacher, but there was a, a, a level of expectation. And the students seemed to rise to that level of expectation. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was very, very low. Um, so I changed that level of expectation while supporting the students. All right, if you can't do it, tell me why. And I will break down that wall, that barrier, whatever it is, that is why you can't do it. So by the end, we were designing, building engineering cars. Uh, we were um, financing them all on their own. Uh, we were um, in the movies, on the news, uh, TV. I mean, it was the fruits of our labor weren't just learning in the classroom. It turned out to be much larger um, outreach and recognition. But the best part was the confidence the students got. We took so many students who were, I, God, I hate to say it, but, but afraid. Um, they felt like they didn't belong in certain environments or certain situations uh, for whatever reason. But you start putting them out there and they talk about what they're good at. And they see an adult engaged in that and telling them, hey, you rock, you know, what you've done here is amazing. That confidence breeds more confidence. And that confidence builds on success and success and confidence. And it's just this wonderful um, escalator. You don't even, once you're on it, you don't even have to start walking anymore. It's, uh, that to me was just awesome. That, I think that speaks to your, your question. You start building on that. So thank you. So Ann, you want to talk a little bit about um, what it's like to be on the hiring end. What, what do these people need to know about getting hired in the school system? What, do you, what kind of knowledge can you dispense here? Oh my goodness, um, where to begin? <laughs> so there's different ways of being hired into the school district. I mean, you might get your feet wet and get experience by being an instructional assistant or a new duty aid, that type of thing. 
we have a variety of types of positions in our district because we are preschool through 12th grade and then we actually have special education that goes up to age 22. So when it comes to being hired, I always feel like you don't want a 10 page resume because the person looking at your resume has about 10 seconds. So you want to highlight the things that you really want someone to see about you on that resume. From my perspective, the program you go through to get your teaching credential isn't necessarily that important. I just need to know that you actually have a teaching credential. So you can get, if you want to work in the preschools or the children's centers, you can go through the ECE program here at City College. If you wanted to teach elementary school, you'll get what's called a multiple subject teaching credential. And if you want to teach at the high school level, you can get either a single subject <coughs> teaching credential. And the single subject and the multiple subject both require um, post units from your bachelor's degree. So once you get your either your BA or your BS, then you would go on to a fifth year program to get that teaching credential. But there's also a credential called a career technical ed credential, and that's what Russ has. And that's based on experience. And you don't necessarily have to have a bachelor's degree to get that career technical ed. So for instance, the teachers we have that teach the industrial arts, whether it's auto shop or um, wood shop, that type of thing. Um, one of the gentlemen we have teaching would at one of our high schools used to run his own company and made the choice to move his family up here to start teaching wood shops. So there's a variety of ways you can get in to public education. And what does your day look like? Do you oh gosh. Oh we've got a question. Okay. Um, so I want to teach school Yes. So I don't have to be a bachelor's necessarily not necessarily because of the career technical ed. That now that Credential does require you have to have so many years of, um, in the industry, uh, there's a variety of different things you would have to do to get there, but you don't necessarily have to have a bachelor's degree. Now I will say that one of the things to think about in teaching is money, as Russ has mentioned. Uh, there isn't necessarily a lot of it. And the teaching salary schedule is based on number of units past your bachelor's degree. So for those that have a career technical ed credential but don't have any sort of bachelor's degree, you would stay at that very first column. You wouldn't ever be able to move up until you got the bachelor's degree. But we actually do have two teachers that have their career technical ed doing culinary arts in two of our high schools. How to, how to explore different levels for teaching, so like what you want to do? You can get um, a, a multiple subject credential, which will allow you to teach elementary school and some and up to some certain grades if you teach more than one subject. Well, it's, it's not, it's more than, just more than one subject, but, um, and then you can get what's called a supplemental credential. So, um, say that you had a, an L, a multiple subject credential, but you really, really loved art or math or whatever, you can qualify either through taking a test or through units you've taken to also add on <coughs> A single subject credential. You can have multiple subject. You know, I I had a teacher that had a multiple subject credential, a single subject in science, elementary, <coughs> PE, and math. <laughs> and so that was great for me as the employer because I'm like, oh, I can plug him in lots of places. Yeah. Or you know, he taught. He literally taught middle school science and kindergarten and first grade PE. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what I will say about that is, you'll be limited in terms of the level. Yes. With that, you can only go up through ninth right, grade. Right. You wouldn't be able to do those higher, if, if it was math, let's say, you wouldn't be able to do the higher level math. Yeah. Let's say there's... Yeah, website, like, what is the I want to be a doctor or a Okay. For math? Yeah. You, <laughs> you, you pick where you, you pick where you want to work. <laughs> <laughs> the and area, choose well. The areas that are the hardest to fill in the state, that, the state of California, just so you know, is headed towards a teacher shortage. And everyone keeps talking about it, but I was actually just up in Sacramento about a week or so ago with all the other people that work with credentials in, um, throughout the state of California at the college level, the school level. There's a really large need for math, 
Uh, as a matter of fact, Long Poke Unified is still hiring right now for math teachers, oh. um, special education teachers, and science teachers. Those are probably the three big areas right now in terms of teaching credentials. So if you desire to teach math, go for it, because you can probably write your own ticket. Yeah, some districts are paying hiring bonuses. Well, I already have my BA, so I can just go to my CMS test and start. You can, with your, with your bachelor's degree and taking the CBEST, you can substitute <laughs> teach. And honestly, I think substitute teaching is a great way to figure out if education is really something you want to do because unfortunately kids will test you when you're at the substitute. Um, but it's a great way to learn school's personalities. What works for this class might not work for this class necessarily in terms of your classroom management skills. It also enriches your experience as a teacher because in at UCSB I did a two-year internship for teachers improving mathematics education where I went into math classes where the teachers were out being trained and I would then teach the math classes and then after in between UCSB and going back to graduate school for the credential I also subbed and I, I got so many different ideas and experiences of different levels. Substitute teaching was a really phenomenal experience. Or take a year and substitute and open yeah. yourself up to all the different possibilities. Pick an area where you like to be uh, uh, geographically and substitute in that area. Because that's another thing that it, it should be noted is that when you get hired in a, in a teaching, uh, in a district, you want to choose carefully because you earn years of, of credit based on your time in that district. And um, now that we're facing a te teacher shortage, districts are more apt to take years, but there have been times where you could have taught in one district for 20 years, but if your family moves, you only get you know, maybe five years of credit on the pay scale. So choose carefully when you decide what area you want to live in. Can I, just one more thing. Now with the uh, sub shortage, Goleta uh, Unified School District has just put out to everyone, we need subs, can you go back and retrain? Um, you could be a sub long term, either within the classroom, or you can do it as a job. It actually mm -hmm. pays very well. I mean, you would never be a day without work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Anne, briefly, can you talk about CBEST, and then we're going to go to Julie. Oh, sure. we've had a Some question here. For oh. can we, let's do questions afterwards, since we're kind of getting short okay. on time. So hang on to your Sorry. questions, and then we'll do them after, okay? Thank you. So the CBEST is the California Basic Educational Skills Test. It looks at reading, writing, and math, essentially. Uh, the website is www.nes. No, wait www.ctcexams.nesinc.com Or you can just Google Or CBEST. Google CBEST. That would be the easier way to do it. I stare at the posters that are on the door to my office every day. So, um, interestingly enough, the state has opened up some of the different ways you can get. So there are alternative alternatives to the CBEST. CBEST is usually the quickest and easiest for people because a lot of times it's harder to track down those other records. <coughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So, Julie, I'd like you to talk about the program here, the ECE program, Early Childhood Education Program, and then um, the pathways from ECE that are, that are possible. Okay. Um, well, ECE covers birth through age eight. So we're responsible for training teachers who want to work with infants and toddlers, with preschoolers, and then there's this before and after school care from say kindergarten to, to third grade. So we don't do the education, the elementary ed in the middle of the day, but the before and after school care. But one of the things that's unique about early childhood education is that we can get you in working with children at the lab school the very first semester that you enroll. So the advantage of that is you can get into a supervised field experience right away and figure out if this is what you love or this is not what you love, you know. Mm -hmm. And it may be that you don't love the age level and you need to look at elementary or secondary, or it may be that you just don't want to be in a classroom with kids. You may want to do something with kids but not a classroom environment. And that's fine. We're happy to have people discover either that this is where they want to be or this is where they don't want to be because it's going to save you time in the long run. Um, the other thing that we have is 
we have just a 12 unit certificate that you can go out and get a job in a, a, a licensed daycare facility right away, start working, and then add to your degree and your units. Um, and we also have a transfer degree, which is a 60 unit degree, and then you can transfer to a four year state college or university from there. So you have options. The other thing is we also house in the ECE department the ED program, which actually provides some education courses you can take while at Santa Barbara City College that will count when you go to a four-year state college to work on your elementary degree or your secondary degree. We also have some practicum sites. We have an Adams School practicum <coughs> site where after you take Ed 101, you can go to Adams twice a week um, and from 8.30 to 10.30 and work in a classroom. And then one hour of that is meeting with the master teacher to discuss what happened and what you learned. We also have, if you want to do secondary education, we can place you in individual middle schools or high schools in a particular subject matter. So again, you can get some experience that will actually count for getting into a credential program eventually in four years. But it also gives you that you know, experience as to whether this is really what you want to do. So we have a lot of students who take ECE for a number of reasons, even if they don't want to be a preschool teacher. They want to be a family therapist. They want to be a speech and language therapist. They want to be an adaptive PE person. They want to work in special ed because we have inclusion programs in our preschools that give you experience working with specialists, language specialists, adaptive PE specialists. So our program can really be the door and a major at Santa Barbara City College that will let you go lots of different directions when you get done with the associate's degree. So if you're thinking about teaching, it may be worth coming in and talking to us and saying, I think I want to do middle schools, but what will this do for me? And Particularly if you're doing elementary ed, it's so great to know what the kids should have experienced in preschool. So if you have a child who's delayed, you know how to work with them and get them back up to where they need to be with their developmental skills. So we encourage people, we say teaching is teaching is teaching. If you want to learn skills and you want to work with children, you can start at one level and then move forward as you want to based on what your interests are and what the opportunities are for you.